Hello, everybody. We are talking about how to save your money on free and cheap art supplies. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't take an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, professional development, and workshops. Doreen, what's up with the Dave and Buster's gift card? This is so specific. How do you use these? My collection that has never stopped growing, I will always treasure. Uh, I started just saving these cards whenever I was younger because I always go to Dave and Buster's, but the thickness of them and the actual like material is really good for whenever I'm using it to screen print and clean my screens without damaging them. So it's like a nice little hack that I found out uh, through some help, but something also that I get to have my favorite things with from being younger. It's just for cleaning. You don't use it like a squeegee? Not for a squeegee. If it were able to... If I build my own Dave & Buster card squeegee, then I'll definitely send a photo of that to you. But <laughs> I don't think it's wide enough for me to actually cover the whole screen in ways that I can evenly apply it. Tell us in the chat, who here collects things? Because when I was a kid, I always collected toilet paper tubes because I just always thought they would be great and I would keep them under my bed. And at a certain point, I just had so many that I was like, I don't know what I'm ever gonna do with these. <laughs> Deep, did you collect? I probably did as a kid. I, I feel like that's a better question for my parents. I'm sure they uh, remember more than I do. But um, no, I think I have a hoarding problem for like other things, just like <laughs> clothes and junk, but nothing with like purpose. Nothing that has just things that then will bite me in the butt when I'm doing spring cleaning. And I'm like, why do I still have this journal I thought I was going to write in every day? And it's like a 2022 journal. <laughs> you know what hurts though is when you move and you're like, I don't need this thing. And then a year later, you're like, where's my, has that happened to you, Dorian? It happens to me every time, especially with moving out of my last studio. Like there are things that I'm like, where was this whenever I needed it? Like I found all of my stuff on my sewing machines. I found tools that I've had to buy three times over because yeah, I need a lot of tools for making. So it's just like, rediscovering things as I'm cleaning, but also holding on to the things I don't need. It's just an accumulation of too much. <laughs> <laughs> so Deep D, why did you list sweet potatoes? Um, well, sweet potatoes, real potatoes, kind of any like gourd actually, I feel like is great. Um, you can use them as like, instead of wood cutting or linoleum, you can carve into them and create really interesting shapes. They're super, well, first of all, like I buy huge bags of potatoes and I very rarely go through all of them um, and they last so long. So the leftovers you can use for like rubber stamps. Um, you can carve into them to create shapes. You can do like sculpture sketches using them. They um, last really long and they have a really nice texture and like material quality to them. So you can manipulate them a lot in a way that you would kind of work with linoleum or wood even. They're sort of like training wheels for sculptors because oftentimes the real material is really difficult. And I think especially for something that requires sharp tools, it can be very dangerous. Dorian, have you ever had training wheel materials? <laughs> you're oh, you're muted. Muting. It happens every time. It's like, I know. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I've used erasers. That's been my go-to like training wheel, so to speak. Uh, and then ever since I watched your video on using soap, I was like, oh, hmm, let me try this out. And I actually like the soap a lot more than that. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. What about you? What was your first training wheel that wasn't soap? I think for me, it was probably foam because mm -hmm. if you want to carve marble, <laughs> which I've never done before. Foam is sort of nice. I mean, it's terribly messy, but you can cut it with a mat knife instead of having to shave everything and things that give you the concept of carving without all of the danger and the expensive materials. So I really believe there's a lot of value in having supplies like that. Here's a fun thing. Who's ever done this before? And we actually did this a lot during the pandemic because people couldn't get out and get art supplies, 
is I told people to just raid their kitchens, their backyards for whatever they can do. And Deep D, this is a fun little treasure hunt in a way. Yeah, there are, I remember when we did this, I feel like it was an art dare or something, but um, yeah, it's first of all, we all have so many tools that we have accessible to us that we just don't realize. And um, it makes you kind of engage with everyday items in a different way than you normally would. It's um, It unlocks like a part of your brain or like scratches a part of your brain that I feel like you don't really um, do very often. So I think it's really cool. I think it's fun to kind of go through stuff that you're not using or like that giant like cotton ball thing you have or Q-tip thing you have and see how you can um, use it in a variety of different ways. And I think it's easy for people to just say, oh, art supplies, art store. But Dorian, I find a lot of this stuff is really inexpensive and they sell expensive versions at the art store. Definitely. Uh, one of the biggest things <laughs> I want to be the reclaim king, like I want to find ways to turn trash into the best item possible. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to be innovative in the ways that you have mark making tools because at the end of the day especially with painting that's what all of these turn into is mark making tools uh yeah <laughs> and i do find that dc when i use a twig and i dip it into ink i'm not as precious as when i'm using some really really expensive nice brush that i bought oh my gosh totally because you're already like accepting the fact that you're doing something strange or absurd or different. And so I think that kind of allows you to play in a way that you might not be able to feel like you can if you're using like a $40 brush, because that's already adding pressure and a price point to your art making process. Um, why would you buy that brush if you weren't going to create something amazing with it? Whereas if you're using a twig, it's like, this doesn't matter. I can go get another twig. And if this twig doesn't work, there are a million other twigs. Seven Angelic, great point. If it makes if it marks it arts, so to speak. And a lot of this is learning to see the potential. I mean, I suppose everybody likes bubble wrap. <laughs> How can you not like bubble wrap? But it's something that I have way too much of, but I'm always saving it because I'm like, well, maybe I'll use something. But I've used it a lot for monotypes where I just paint acrylic on top. I press it against something and it's just really unexpected. And Dorian, that's what I like about these tools is that we oftentimes have no idea what they're going to do, as opposed to say a paint marker, I pretty much know what's going to happen. Yeah, I think the whole point and also these unconventional tools is that you get to experiment with them and test their limits as well as the limits of what you're making the marks on, uh, what the material you're using to make the marks, like are you using paint, ink, et cetera. Uh, it, as Deep you said, like it allows you to scratch that itch that you didn't know you needed to scratch. Uh, because when you're in those moments, you do things in such a creative, there's a creative process that you unlock that you didn't know you had access to. And it strengthens your other creative processes as a result. Blue Wolf says, I wish I could find a way to do something with pine needles. You know something? I met an artist here in Salt Lake City who made these beautiful pine needle sculptures. They didn't even look like pine needles the way that she put them together, but they were such elegant forms. So sometimes it's just, oh, I've got it around. Why not I do something with that? Another tip from Jazz, flat Lego sheets are cool to stamp too, like bubble wrap. And Anna says, cheap painter's brushes from the hardware store. And Lisa says, bubble wrap for abstract prints. Dorian, you seem to raid your recycle bin pretty often. A lot, every day. It's kind of unhealthy. No, no. Uh, yeah, I love just making use of things that people don't think twice about. Uh, being able to create shoes and other products and ideas and prototype with unconventional materials, I think, gives new life to the product I'm creating as well as allows me to think deeper about the materials I would actually select for the piece itself. Uh, so all of the pieces in this actually had an actual purpose, uh, like the protective mesh look and how there's like the aluminum can. So that's a more rigid material. 
Uh, there's just different ways I wanted to integrate materiality uh, based off of what materials were accessible to me. Deepti, I also think because these are not art supplies where we know how they're going to perform, there's a little bit of a learning curve here. Have you seen that? Yeah, definitely. It's almost like the material is informing your art kind of, and um, it is unpredictable. Um, and it's cool in an exploratory kind of way, even like looking at this piece story. And I think it's like an egg carton that you have for the sole of the shoe. And um, that's something that I feel like probably that form got in informed, form got informed by the egg <laughs> carton, you know, like by seeing that egg carton in a different way and what that kind of reminded you of and what it looked like and where then it would be placed in the world of shoe. Um, and I think that's just in general, when we're working with found objects or unusual um, tools, it's almost like we are having a conversation with the tool for it to kind of inform us as well um, so that we can do things differently than what we normally would. The supplies don't always behave. Sometimes I look at something and I think, oh, this will be, and it's like, it doesn't work. <laughs> Does that happen to you, Dorian? <laughs> Oh, every time, whenever I think that I can like either twist something just enough and then it snaps or whenever, it, like basically you're testing the limit of it and seeing how far you can get it to go. Uh, and when it doesn't cooperate, it's not fun at all, but at least you learned the limit that you can take it to. Uh, so I guess I try to look at the silver lining, especially when I'm dealing with materials like this, because if you don't, then you're going to be very stressed very quickly. <laughs> Blue Wolf. Dell's Lemonade, oh my gosh, you guys have no idea how sad I am. I can't go get Dell's Lemonade. Clara, like, I will send you drink? some. I will send you oh. some. They have the powdered packets now, so all you have to do is put it in a blender. Oh my gosh, <laughs> can you send me some too? I will happily, look, I will happily send those as Christmas presents for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I mean, that's where it's so specific. I mean, yeah, egg cards, a lot of people have those, but it's fun when it's something really, really specific. All right. My next pick is shoe polish. This is what I used in graduate school. I had these almost life size plaster sculptures, and they just look really bad when they're straight plaster. And so I oftentimes would do these patinas where I would use shellac and I would actually polish and rub the shoe polish into the surface of the plaster. And it, it's very convincing. Like I actually have had people look at the actual pieces and go, oh, wow, where'd you get this cast? I'm like, no, it's shoe polish. I mean, and it's funny because it's this one brand. You can't do it with any other brand. I've tried the other ones. And this is, of course, a brand that is not that common. And so I found this one shoe store in Manhattan that carried these. And I would just go in and buy all of these shoe polish jars because it takes a lot to really cover the entire sculpture. I mean, Deep D, have you ever been in a place where you're like, oh my God, these people at the store must think I'm crazy. Oh yeah, definitely. I think all the time in college, I would just be, not even in a store, like I feel like I would be outside people's house, like gathering like leaves and twigs and, you know, people would be like, what is happening? Um, this could be my Christmas present to you. I could go to whatever the store that was and then have to <laughs> polish. But I'm floored. I was so convinced that this, I, I would never have guessed that this was plaster with shoe polish. By the way, Thank you so much, Anna, for the super sticker. We so much appreciate it. <laughs> and remember, everybody, we are doing right now the fall raffle. We have extended it to Saturday, December 9th. Unfortunately, it's because our Instagram is still suspended. <laughs> and yes, I'm in cardiac arrest. I like to not think about it, but... Yeah, we, we had to extend because, oh my gosh, a big portion of our audience we engage with on Instagram. So we need your help more than ever. So if you would like to support the raffle, you can give a super chat or a sticker during the stream that will enter you into the raffle. But we also have the raffle page link was in the YouTube video description below. All right, Deep Deep, tell us the story of this project. So this was a chair, a stool, sorry, a stool that I made um, my freshman year of college. So let's just keep in mind, she was 17 when she made this, let's be kind. Um, 
But uh, yeah, all jokes aside, it was uh, our challenge was to make it with chipboard. Um, and you can buy chipboard in like large quantities, but also when you buy like art pads, oftentimes that back of an art pad is chipboard. So if you need like an 18 by 24 chipboard, you could just use the back of your art pad. So it's something that you probably already have or can kind of double whammy buy some art paper and then also get some chipboard out of it. Um, and you can do tiny sculptures, big sculptures, but I think this was a cool project because it had to um, hold my weight. Um, and it's such a kind of seemingly flimsy material, but you can actually mold it and shape it and it can, you know, be put into forms that can hold weight and stuff. So it was a really cool learning experience. This is a really good example that sometimes it is worth going to buy it at the art store, because technically speaking, you could just save corrugated cardboard. The chipboard's still pretty cheap. It's only like a dollar for the very thin kind. So Doreen, how do you know when it's worth going to the art store to get the nice version versus picking up corrugated cardboard everywhere? Well, I think some materials warrant you to consider, is this good for a final product or is this good for the prototype because if i'm using like i would say pizza boxes to do a prototype uh, because it's already probably beaten up it probably has grease stains you know it's something that i don't have to put too much care and effort into uh and if i make a cut somewhere then i'm not really mad about it but if i go to the store and buy the chipboard then i'm like okay so now i've seen what i've done with the cardboard how can i carry that knowledge into the chipboard that's a raw material probably more sturdy a lot cleaner, it looks a lot better. And also, Deep D, you had a good stool, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> because the chipboard really is nice because it's so smooth, it's very flexible. And I just find, like you're saying, that sometimes we need the mock-up with the crummy materials. And then when we use the nicer ones, it feels like we have a little bit of a plan. And I think Deep D, especially with this type of thing, you have to have those rehearsals with all of these materials. Yeah, definitely. Especially when you're like learning to work with the new material or you're making something like the final or working on a prototype for like a stool or something that has to hold weight. It's good to try mm -hmm. prototypes and like see what's working and see what's not working so that you don't just jump into the final thing and then your work just comes crashing down. Well, Jazz has a good tip. Go to Costco for chipboard and cardboard sheets. There's four by four feet sheets between the toilet paper. Oh my God. That sounds like a really good idea. I'm going to Costco. I know. This is really funny. And Inji says, I'm on an island for a month and searching for recycled art supplies out of necessity. I Go to the recycling yeah, your geography oftentimes can actually really impact what it is that you're doing. And thank you, Inchi, for the super chat. We so much appreciate your support. Keep those coming, every. Guess what? They really, really add up over time. You don't have to contribute a huge amount for it to be impactful. This butter knife, I was spending probably six hours out of every day of my two-year MFA sculpture program with this butter knife because it's so good for plaster. And I tried other things, like they sell things at the hardware store that are supposedly for plaster. But the thing is, when you're plastering something for a construction site, it's not the same thing as if you're using it to make a waste mold around a sculpture. And I tried all these other things. I, actually, they sell plaster knives that are for sculpture, and I didn't like them. They weren't good. The butter knife was the best thing. So it, it's interesting, Deepti, how sometimes the cheap version is better than the expensive version. Yeah, definitely. I feel like I've found that so many different times that like a cheap random thing will work so much better. Um, sometimes even like when I'm eating food, I'm like, oh, this two dollar something tastes so much better than this like Michelin star restaurant but yeah that's why like I mean that's a good metaphor for just like try everything and see what works best for your process rather than 
accepting that a dollar sign equals that it works better or is, um, you know, the thing to do. So Doreen, you know how sometimes, well, I do this when I go to the store and I think, oh, this seaweed is $20 more. It must be better. But I find with art supplies, price doesn't always tell you what you're getting. <laughs> yeah. With me, when I started doing art, like first grade me was going to the dollar store with my parents and being like, okay, what supplies can I get in the dollar store and as many as I could? Because uh, it didn't have to be the highest quality product for you to be able to express something. I think that's one thing that people need to recognize is it's all about what you're saying, not necessarily the price of the material you're using to say that thing. That's why sometimes I don't trust the art store because they sell so many dumb things at the art store that I just think are absurd. And they have those disposable palettes and I've never understood, they're always really small, like this big. I'm like, what is this? I'd rather just go to the grocery store and buy freezer paper where I can just have a palette the size of my table <laughs> if I want it. And I've just never understood it. It makes me feel like the art stores are trying to delude us or something. Like they're tricking us into buying these supplies. <laughs> All right. How about raffle uh, onion skins? Raffle onion skins. Sorry, raffle right? skins are pretty. Raffle, skins. <laughs> raffle on the mind. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All day. Uh, yeah, so for me, I also do experiments with dyes, and one of the ones that I actually recently tried was onion skins, specifically red onion skins, uh, and the actual outer layer, the outer membrane holds, a, oh, I'm trying to think of how to say it in the easiest way. There's color inside of the skin that can be released through boiling the skin, and so whenever you boil it for a certain amount of time, you let it steep then all of that is released and you have a beautiful rich red dye so i found that out by mistake because i just experimented and started boiling stuff and did a little bit of research on what parts of vegetables and fruits actually contained uh, that stuff i mean deep d sometimes we're not even looking for an art supply and all of a sudden we're using something I don't know, maybe you got these certain knives from the takeout place. It's like, whoa, these are really good. Or you know what I always save is those little condiment containers that you get. So we have an Indian place we order from here and I always wash those, like, keep them for paint. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Those condiment thing, I know exactly the ones you're talking about. They're yeah, like yeah. The perfect size for paint. Um, even like plastic spoons and stuff that I get for takeout, like those, I never actually use them for my takeout, but I keep them because they're, you know, great to just like have. And Dorian, you have been using a lot of these techniques for making your clothing. Yeah. And in this image, for instance, I actually had roses that were dead and I wanted to use them as a stamping tool. So I dip them in the dye and then I would take it to the hoodie and I would use it as like an actual method of stamping and imprinting the images of flowers. Uh, and actually led to some really cool, uh, I guess, shapes and forms and also just flowed really nicely on the hoodie that I didn't expect. Uh, and then by accident in the same batch of the roses, there were eucalyptus leaves and I touched them by accident and it let off this yellow dye onto my fingers, which was really interesting. So that led to me putting those on water, boiling it. And then I had this really rich yellow dye that I was able to put on to some more hoodies. So yeah, there's ways to be sustainable in your ways of creating and making. Uh, you just have to be willing to explore that. Deep D, I think sometimes we also have to be in an experimentation mindset because I definitely have been in that situation where I'm using some brush and it's not doing what it said it was gonna do. You know, you buy these things and they're like, this fan brush is so good for this. I'm like, no, it's not, this is false advertising. And so you, you do have to lean into the unpredictability of a lot of these supplies. And so how do you recommend not being frustrated? Because it is so easy to go, oh, I'm not getting the results I want. 
Yeah, it's, it's really easy to get frustrated. And I think um, allowing yourself to go back to the quote unquote drawing board and experimenting is like the best way when you're feeling that frustration bubble up is to be like, okay, where where else can I find something that might work? Like if I was on a on an island and I had to create this mark or, or accomplish this, what would I use that was accessible to me? Um, and then I think not worrying about your final piece, but just allowing yourself to experiment and go back to that sketchbook phase is um, the best way to engage with that fun and experimentation and make it a little bit more of a playful approach. And a lot of times I think that's kind of where you um, strike and find gold um, and can then develop based off of that. Out of curiosity. Oh, you go. Oh, no, I was just going to say, out of curiosity, how many sketchbooks do you guys both have? Or that you, like, oh my use? Gosh. <laughs> I, got whole, I got a whole shelf that's all sketchbooks. And I have them going back to when I was five. What? I never got rid of them. Oh, my gosh. I would love to see that clarify. <laughs> Guess what? There's a stream. Just look up Art Prof Ugly Messy. You'll find it. <laughs> I went through all of them. It was crazy. I know. <laughs> oh my gosh. I have, I don't think I have that many. Um, I've been sketching digitally a lot recently because I've just found it easier to do that on, on Procreate. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have tons of sketchbooks. My one qualm is that I never finish a sketchbook. I never do either. And That's why do thing. people get so hung up on that? I just feel like I'm wasting paper. <laughs> do you use both sides of the paper? I do. Depends. I mean, my sketchbook is really ugly. This is what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> there's like nothing in it. I mean, like once in a while there's a portrait, but most of it looks like this. So yeah, I mean, it's like serial killer writing. You know, that type of thing. <laughs> That's so funny. Jazz has some suggestions for you, Dorian. Buy some iron tablets and try with dyeing Uifer or Palifer and Alum. Oh, geez, I don't even know what any of those things are. But that's really cool <laughs> to take some notes. And Lisa says, my library often asks members to donate cottage cheese containers for art classes, nice water containers. I know they're just exactly the right size. <laughs> okay, deep deep stop motion animation. A lot of people think about animation. They think about software and iPads and things like this. But why do you suggest found objects for stop motion? Because we all know, for example, Nightmare Before Christmas and Wallace and Gromit, but you're saying no, use found objects. Yeah, I mean, both films you mentioned are wonderful, but I think it's very labor intensive in stop motion when you're creating puppets and armature. And I think um, when you're first getting into it, especially like you really don't need it's it's more about what you do with the objects than really what you're using or how you find similarities between objects. Um, so finding like, you know, leaves or, or using tools around your house or in this frame, it's like pom pom balls and little clay objects that I had already made. So um, it's really endless, like what you can do with things that are just lying around your house and stop motion animation. That's one of the reasons I love teaching stop motion as like an entry to animation, because it's really like you don't need to put in that much work to get a cool end result. I know that people are very impressed by fancy things that artists can do that require a lot of skill. But Dorian, one thing I always think about with these supplies is how easy it is to learn when the object is just so ordinary. Because I just posted this video, Mia using her rug tufting gun and it's all scary. And I look at that thing and I'm like, oh, this does not make me want to learn it. And so what do you think it is about these more humble supplies that make learning a little easier? In the, I guess in the best way possible, people can't handle change in some sort of ways. Uh, and having something that's so familiar and so easy to just recognize takes away a lot of the fear of being able to even interact with it. Because I know for me personally, if I have like my paper, like sketchbook that I, you know, beaten up and dragged in my blah, 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 blah. Like, I'm just going to toss it into my book bag. But if I have my iPad, I'm folding it up. 
I'm finding my Apple pencil. Like I'm putting in like a case. I'm taking care of it. There's ways that we treasure things with value. So uh, being able to just have fun with it and just go with it because of that familiarity, I think is the reason. Tell us in the chat, what art supplies intimidate you? For me, the rug tufting gun. I'm like, dude, I don't want to go anywhere near Mia when she's holding that thing. But actually, you know, what's funny is I got this new stand for my phone. It's like, um, it gets rid of the shakiness. I think oh, the gyroscopic like ones? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, I'm still intimidated by this thing. I still haven't read the manual. I mean, my spouse has figured out the whole thing, but I still am a little overwhelmed by all the various options. And so I think there are supplies where it's just like, what, how do I even begin? Deep D, has that ever happened to you? Oh, definitely. I feel like, especially working as an animator, sometimes with like new programs, like I've had Cinema 4D downloaded on my computer for so long and I just cannot get myself to engage with it because it just seems like such a task. And even with like, you know, fancy watercolor or something that has like a higher price point, it just feels like, oh my God, whatever I do to this has to be the best thing ever because I spent so much money on it or it's something that someone else would, you know, kill to have. So I should, you know, take this responsibility that I get to have this material. But um, yeah, then, then it's like five years later and you haven't even touched the dang thing, so. <laughs> Here's another sculpture trick, because again, plain plaster by itself is just not that attractive. And in graduate school, I wasn't going to carve things out of marble or get things cast in bronze. It's absurdly expensive. And so this butcher's wax is really great. First of all, once you buy a can, you're set for five lifetimes as far as sculpting goes. And it just makes this really nice, soft, almost satiny sheen on the surface. So you just take a cotton rag and you just wipe and wipe and you put all these various layers on and it, it really looks good. And I, I just can't believe that something as ugly as butcher's wax could produce such beautiful results. And so again, that's why where we get surprised. But the thing is, Dorian, a lot of these are little secrets that not everybody knows. <laughs> so. Do you have recommendations for how to find these hacks? One of the best pieces of advice that I got was from a photographer and he said, don't look, if you're taking a photo, don't look at where everyone else is looking, find the place that no one else is looking. So I think that's the biggest piece of advice is looking where the unexpected thing might be and being willing and open to just say, hey, okay, I see this thing. I wanna use it on my work. And you don't have to do it on like a piece that you actually really, really care about, but take the time to just actually see what it does and what you can do with it. Because then it also open your mind up to all the possibilities of the things that you probably overlooked. Let's take a look at this painting by Lauren. And she used all kinds of acrylic paints, but she also used coffee grounds. And I know you learned about this from Lauren Deep D and have been thinking about this. And I think you've used it a few times. Yeah, I mean, I think coffee grounds are great because it is, um, well, in this form, it provides like a textural quality, but it also can help like build up mass. So it helps your acrylics kind of become sculptural. Um, all things that I learned from Lauren, so credit to her. Um, so it's really cool, like it turns paintings into like kind of 3D works of art, which I think is really cool. But coffee grounds are awesome too, because it almost works as a dye, like it can dye your paint, but you can use it to dye paper and create um, interesting prints and textures too with like the speckles of the coffee grounds. So it's a really versatile um, media or a tool that you can use. And oftentimes you could just use the used coffee grounds that you just made your coffee with. So instead of chucking it out, just use it and create a dye or, or put it in your paint and see what happens. I have used a bunch of golden, heavy acrylic gel mediums before, and they're expensive. I mean, one little jar is like $30 and they have one called glass bead gel. And there's another one called pumice gel. Honestly, the coffee grounds are better. And here's why. The glass bead gel, every piece of that plastic bead, they're exactly the same. But the coffee grounds, because they're natural and 
there are four, some parts are chunkier, some parts a little thinner. And so Doreen, I really thrive upon things that are quote, flawed. Look, and at the end of the day, nothing is truly entirely flawed. Like one man's trash is another treasure and i believe in that firmly so there's always some way that you can f unlock a hidden treasure anna has used soil and sand and ng says a watercolor style with wet smarties whoa i need to try that now <laughs> so you'll all see not only you can look stuff up you can listen to us obviously but when you talk to other artists this is how you learn these things. Because Deep Dee, if you try to look it up online, it's really hard to find. Oh yeah, totally. There's, I mean, other than our list of things, um, you know, there, I don't think the internet has too many ideas for where you can find things, but yeah, other, I feel like you can ask any artist what they used to use. I mean, that makes me think of like Jello packets for dye and like Kool-Aid mm. and like that yeah. reminds me of so many things I've used also that I forgot about. But yeah, there's a whole world of like cheap food, Sunny D, like, you know, so many things that you can use for like color pigment dyes. This too, you guys would not believe how many aluminum cans I had to go through for my sculpture degree. This is something called a shim, which is the aluminum can. So you cut them up, in this very particular size, the can is exactly the length <laughs> that you want the shim to be. And you just put the shims into the ceramic clay. So the clay is not dry yet. It's still very wet. You put the shim in and then it separates the bits of plaster, which are then the individual mold pieces. So you can imagine for a sculpture this big, I think the sculpture is like four feet tall or something. You're just cutting aluminum cans just nonstop to put these shims together. And they're exactly the right width. Honestly, if it were a, I don't know, Red Bull can, that would probably be too thick. The aluminum shims, they have to be a certain thinness. And this is, ex it's like they were created to be shims. And then somebody said, oh, let's just use them for soda cans. It's mm -hmm. sort of extraordinary what <laughs> these things are capable of doing. Oh, Maria says, I'm doing a paper cooling course. We need to apply very small areas of glue. We've been using toothpicks to pick up the right amount of white glue and then apply it to the paper coils. And Carolyn also says, I have used Kool-Aid to dye yarn. See, I mean, Dorian, isn't this so cool that in this one stream, we've already given each other suggestions? Oh, I've been taking notes. I'm definitely going to go and buy some iron packets to see what I can do with my dyes. Caroline says, if you are dying with Kool-Aid, get the sugar free <laughs> That is very what? true. That is Why? very true. That's really smart. Because they can crystallize, right? Like if you put it on yarn, your mm -hmm. yarn can get like but, sticky and that, that might be a cool tie-dye because if it crystallizes in some part. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> See, look, this is beauty. This is the beauty of it. Uh all right, everybody. Ooh. Remember, fall raffle extended set Saturday, December 9th. We need your help because you know what? All of what we provide content wise is free and accessible to everybody. We have been picking up the check for your art prof dinners. And just this one time, we're gonna ask you to buy us one appetizer. You don't have to buy the whole meal. We will provide it for you, your art prof dinner, but we need your help because guess what? It's expensive to run this platform. We have to pay staff, we have expenses, we have all kinds of things, and somebody has to help us. And you know something? Probably 80% of what we get for our budget comes from supporters. I'm not rolling in cash, trust me, you guys. So we definitely need your help. You can do your donation in any number of ways. We have all these cool wish lists. You can help us buy art supplies, or this is so cute. This is a new prize. Mia will draw your cartoon. I mean, what was your reaction, Dorian, when you got this? I'm not gonna lie, I was very impressed. I I I couldn't even be mad. I was like, it actually looks like me. Like I'm always smiling and laughing. So I'm, yeah, I was happy. It made my day. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, they're so cute, you guys. Also, my Bread Fairy print shop is open. And so those are some prizes as well. If you contribute, you can definitely enter to win a Bread Fairy print. Please join Deep D and I. We're going to be in the Discord right after the stream. We will be in the post live stream stage channel. That is where you get to talk to us on voice. Join our Patreon group. As Lisa says, the Patreon group is an easy way to support. And you get so many cool things. You get voice sessions with staff, long nerdy critiques from me. And there is no critique rule in the Patreon group, which is fantastic because you don't have to do any of the work <laughs> that you have to do in the public channels. And look at this, these amazing top Patreon supporters who, again, are keeping the lights on. If we lost the support, we would go under overnight. And so thank you all for that wonderful support. Visit artprof.org. There's so much content on there, free content. That's not on YouTube. Use the search bar. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And subscribe for more art tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>